This is the On The Mark Podcast, bringing you facts, opinions, and personal experiences from the outdoor industry. I got the opportunity to shoot an AR-15. That was one of the funnest experiences that I've had. It's it's pretty exciting. It's a a big rush. Presented by Sightmark, an industry leader in optics, bore sights, night vision, and more. Make your mark. That thing is getting dust all over it and riding on the ranch on that ATV, and there was a lot of wind yesterday and today and it's just like the winds you see it just all this dust blowing i'm like oh that's a pretty good recommendation i don't know anything it's about not that. anything that i don't think anybody makes them right but you now. can pull it off real quick yeah you you you've invited me out there but all i've heard are words you've been on vacation drinking beer i was working <laughs> usually <laughs> welcome to the on the mark podcast i'm your host jeff hamilton um I run, I have dual responsibilities here at Selmark, and for a little while there, uh, my other responsibilities required all of my attention. I had no extra time uh, to devote to the podcast, but I'm happy to announce we're getting back into it. Um, to kick things back off, I got Christian Wolvers here with us in the studio. Thanks for having Over me. Over here, I got um, Kevin Reese. He's uh, our in-house uh, media what did, what did you even do you do here, actually? Yeah, uh, I know you write stuff. <laughs> nothing. Clean Which, the bathrooms. That's what I do. He's no, a, My job is to network and make friends with people, build relationships. I handle media relations. Thank you Media relations handler. Yeah. That's Kevin Reese over there. He's in the corner. He'll be joining us as well. A couple of things to uh, kind of get us rolling. I got to give a couple of shout outs. First one is to Sightmark. Sightmark's the sponsor of this show. They're the ones that make this all happen. Uh, this is the official show for Sightmark's, the On The Mark podcast. So we're always happy for um, always happy to talk Sightmark products and, and stuff like that on this show. However, it's not a product push, so we're not going to be diving into a lot of that uh, type of stuff. We'll mention them here and there. Um, but really, we want to talk about life experiences and good times, which is why we brought Christian in, because he's done a lot of those type of things. The next shout out I got to do is for Timber Creek Outdoors. Uh, you might notice here in the middle of the table, I've got the... Um, timber creek outdoors rifle here they donated the hardware to this rifle it was then installed by mr kevin reese he's also the uh, hardware installer the custom gun builder if jack you wanna... of all trades master of none he can do a little bit of everything not a lot of anything um <laughs> timber creek timber creek outdoors uh they provide kits for your rifles so uh, if you guys want to deck out some of your rifles um, they got all kinds of kits that could could get you set up there uh, in that aspect Um, so from there we're just going to kind of roll right into things on this day in 2002 somebody was introduced to the rock and roll hall of fame who was it 2002 2002 rock and roll hall of fame The Ramones. Ah. The Ramones on 2000, 2002, on this day, were introduced into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Mm-hmm. That's significant um, only because Christian here is a world renowned bass player. <laughs> is that yeah. right? Yeah. He also guitar. shreds on guitar. I've seen videos. Yeah. And Play guitar. guitar as well. Okay, yeah. cool. Well, tell us a little bit more about you. Um, you know, how did you, how did you grow up? How did you get into music? Well, I grew up in Europe in a city called Antwerp in Belgium, okay, which is about uh, 30 miles north from Brussels and about 10, 15 miles from the Dutch border. So I grew up in the Flemish part of, of Belgium up north and uh, my dad was from Holland. And um, my dad was really into hunting. My, and uh, my godfather was um, a big shot at a FN Herstal in Belgium, and oh, my other cool. uncle worked for Browning Hunting. Oh wow! In Belgium, so you know, I had unc- and I had other uncles that would get all these toys from all these companies, and you know, so I was around a lot of guns, and and um, my dad had them just sitting wall to wall, you know, yeah. and hanging on the wall, and you know, I go in that room once in a while, and you know, my dad always told me like, don't touch anything, right? And <laughs> to teach me a lesson. He loaded everything up, safety's off, so all I had to do was pull the trigger, <laughs> and my uncle told him, like, you're crazy. He's going to shoot himself. He goes, oh, well, he's going to learn a lesson the hard way, but he's going to learn that lesson. <laughs> and sure enough, there was a rifle sitting in that room, which he made a custom silencer for, right? Yeah. And I didn't know what gauge, what caliber it was, but it stuck out beyond everything in the room. Yeah. And there were some heavy calibers in that room. Yeah. 
and this thing stuck out this high above everything else. So I picked that one up because that can was about it looked yeah. enormous on that rifle. Yeah. And uh, at the time, I didn't know, but it was a 22. And I put that thing on my lap. And I'm sitting there looking at whoa, and I'm like 12. Yeah. You know, like dumb as shit. <laughs> and I pull the trigger on that, and it goes, <laughs> and I'm like, what? I couldn't even tell if it went off. But I shot pellet rifles before. Yeah. And, it's, and it was kind of similar. Yeah. And I was like, wait a minute. And I started searching the ground, and I see like a little, sure enough, a little 22 shell. Oh, no. And I pick it up, and it's warm. And I'm like, oh, that came out of that rifle. And I look at the door, the, the bedroom door, and I see a little light beaming through from the, the hallway <laughs> window that was behind it. Oh, man. And I was like, I'm going to get, I'm done. My dad's going to beat me to shit for this. <laughs> so I took that rifle into the backyard, unloaded it, <laughs> and put it back. <laughs> yeah, like, I might as well. Might and as I think well he was, and I know for a fact he knew what happened. Like, yeah. he, I covered up that hole in the door with like wood paint and all that shit. So yeah. I, he didn't know, notice that. <laughs> but I think he noticed at one point that his rifle was unloaded. Yeah. Maybe to a point where he was like, did I load it? Maybe I confused him so much because I never got a beating for that. And I would have got a, you know, it would have been on a dinner table one night. Boom, there it comes. You know what I mean? That's how my dad was. Yeah. And he, I never got punished for that. So he probably got so confused. Like, there's no way he picked out that rifle and unloaded it. You know what I mean? He was probably like super, super confused. Yeah. It probably still bothers him to this day. <laughs> yeah, that's the last time you touched it, right? That was, yeah. I never touched anything else because I knew whatever else I was going to pick up in that room was going to be a bigger hole in that door. <laughs> yeah, you you, uh, you got off lucky with that being a 22. I got lucky. Mm, yeah. I got lucky. Oh, Thanks man. for that big ass can on the top of it. <laughs> yeah. Kevin, got all your guns loaded up, ready for your kids to play with them? Why you ask so many questions, Copper? <laughs> <laughs> we do not no. we do not condone that. But no. this that is, is an interesting, interesting story. way to teach your kids. Yeah, this is nineteen eighty four. In well, Belgium. <laughs> you know? Yes. Hey, what are you gonna do? I mean, I love John Wayne movies and you know, Clint Eastwood movies and my, my mom, that's all she watched, all those spaghetti westerns and you know, as soon as I watch one of those movies, my mom, I go outside and I'm playing my little toy revolvers or whatever. And, you know, you got all these big toys sitting upstairs in a room. And the house that I grew up in was not a conventional house. I grew up in a beer factory yeah. that was being converted to a home. And it was all over the place. And a lot of the stuff you could just break into and walk into, really. And I was in a small city. So my dad, one time, we were at my uncle's getting drunk after my boarding school. Because I went to boarding school. And Friday night, my dad picked me up, takes me to my uncle's house. He gets drunk over there, and right before we were about to leave, he goes, get up, we're leaving. And he goes, I got a M16 and a Colt 45 right by your bed. And I'm like, what the hell is he talking about? <laughs> what? I didn't even like, I heard it, but I didn't ask questions because he was drunk and I know he, he can get. So we get home and I walk in my room and there's an M16 sitting next to my bed <laughs> and a holster like old Western style holster with a Colt 45 single action revolver in it. And all the Colt 45 long Colts in the, in, the, in the belt. And I was like, what the fuck? And he never really said anything about it. He goes, I just got to store this right here. But yeah. he put it in my room. We could put it in his room right next door. <laughs> but he put it in my room. I never understood why. But I remember that M16 had bipod on it, I think. And I was laying with that thing on my bed, looking through <laughs> it into a mirror, you know, like it was like the best toy I ever had. And I never racked it. I never, I didn't even know how to pull the magazine. I don't think I never looked into it if it, was, if it was loaded and I never tried to, but the only thing I ever tried to put around the chamber at my dad's house was when I found a SS Luger, yeah. nine millimeter Luger from an SS officer that my dad had won in a card game from my mom's uncle that had it and I had the engravings of the SS and everything in it and my dad wanted in a card game and he had it under his pillow and I tried to rack that thing when I was a kid one time I couldn't get one in the chamber because he, that goes kind of up like that yeah and uh, I remember my uncle no my mom's uncle calling my dad one time in the morning and my dad's sitting there like after he got wasted one night and, and he goes nope I'm not giving it back and he hung up and then he was like fuck you asshole he was like you know <laughs> And I was like, what? I'm like, okay. 
And then I found out the story that my, he was trying to get the pistol back from my dad because they lost. They were all drunk and he lost in the car game. He's yeah. like, no, I'm not giving that thing back. Yeah, <laughs> You lost that. And, and I remember he kept calling. My dad just kept ignoring and called him in an asshole. <laughs> That's why he was hiding guns in your room. He was getting him away from all his other stash. I, I, like... I think his story was that he had a friend that was a collector and he, and he was moving and he did the store for a while. Yeah. Later on in life, like when I was like, you know, really living in the States for about 20 years, my mom finally came out of the woodwork and told me that, oh, your dad was a smuggler. I'm like, what? Wait, wait, what? <laughs> on tour sometime with all my friends, and she kind of like finally dropped the bomb. I'm like a smuggler, and it all started making sense. You know when like your mom tells you something in life, and then all kind of all the puzzles just kind of com it's completed that last piece to where you yeah. like see the picture. Yeah. And the picture was there was a secret room in our factory that my dad had locked with a door, steel door on it, and there was all kinds of toys in there. Yeah. But he, you know, Antwerp is a is a haven, a port, so he hung out with a lot of shady mafioso type of dudes that were getting things from. You know, my, my mom, every time my dad was drunk and, and my mom was pissed at him, he'd come home with some new type of appliance, <laughs> like it was the Sopranos, you know what I mean? Like straight off the back of the truck. We had everything. We had a microwave when they first came out, and I was like, oh, my mom was the happiest in the world. My dad could have done anything, you know, could have cheated, yeah. and he was forgiven because my mom had microwaves, dishwashers, <laughs> everything, you know? So, Extras in the garage. So my dad was shady as hell, you know? And I realized that later on in life when, you know, my dad was driving a car from Holland to Belgium with a double bottom. Coffee, <laughs> cigarettes, tax-free. The tax-free thing back in those days in the 60s and 70s was a big thing. Right. My life sucked, man. My pop was so. doing sheet metal. <laughs> <laughs> well, my dad was an electrician, but he would never go. He would go to work oh, at 2 in the afternoon. And I go, why is he going to work at 2? He's, he works for himself, but... Yeah. He goes to work, does like three things. He worked in this diamond district in Antwerp a lot for a lot of like, you know, like uh, like really rich Jewish diamond dealers, you know. And they loved him over there. He had the keys to all those shops and everything. And and there was a bar, and that bar was definitely a mafia type of bar where, you know, and he probably had a lot of connections and doing a lot of shady shit that I didn't really know about, you know. So how do you go from um, mafia smuggler extraordinaire life <laughs> to musician when did that transition take yeah, place i never participated in any uh <laughs> okay, of, the, no, of his sure, dealings sure, sure but um <laughs> you know like i i think it was skateboarding i started going to this roller rink mm -hmm. in the outskirts of antwerp and that was around the time when all the hormones are kicking in and the girls are looking good and you're 14 15 years old and and uh, there was this half pipe in that roller ring and there was a bunch of skaters hanging on. They looked like all American, American clothing, the fans, you know, all the, the, the surf skateboard wear from like the early 80s. And uh, I started watching those guys all the time. I became friends with them, started skateboarding. With skateboarding, a lot of music came associated, associated with it. One, one of those, uh, the very first Paul Peralta Bones Brigade show was the first skateboard movie that really came out in 1984 that was the modern skateboarding introducing and there was a lot of music involved with that which really I started listening to because I saw it in these films Yeah, and a lot of these bands were super cool and then I wanted to pick up a guitar and that's kind of how um, you know picking up a guitar was not easy you know I didn't really have anybody to show me I didn't have no brothers or sisters or so I learned everything on my own and, and discovering music was all basically through skate, that skateboard scene, which was a, lot, a group of people and everybody had their own things, niches that they were into and you were picking off of those and somebody loved the cult and somebody was listening to NWA and, and it was hardcore suicidal tendencies and all these bands. And, you know, music really, you know, once I started learning in music that you know being on stage and seeing bands and we're like wow that that imagine that feeling of being on stage and and it was always that search for that feeling i guess and then you start playing in bands and you know it starts happening you know we're opening up for this band whoa you know yeah. open, opening up for some of your bands that you were listening to yeah that's kind of like the first like wow we made it we're op we opened up for dri or something yeah. like you know and then basically, like later on, I was like, you know, I want to take this trip to the U.S. and go check out some American bands and the scene and go buy a bunch of cool clothes and come back, you know? Yeah. That type of thing. 
and I never came back. <laughs> <laughs> You're one of them. <laughs> one of them. <laughs> I, I, you know, I started hanging out in, in Venice, California, and hung out with one of my favorite bands called a band called Beowulf, which was a hardcore band. And then um, from then, I uh, ended up in Hollywood. Bumped into a band that I was already friends with, but called Biohazard, yeah. a hardcore metal band. And then they introduced me to Fear Factory. They were like, "You should be in Fear Factory." I was like, "What?" I go, "I heard of that band." They go, "They're going to go on tour with Sepultura soon, and they need a bass player." And they introduced me, sent me on my way with a bass to try out. Yeah, and that was it. The rest is history. Nice. I ended up in Fear Factory, and I mean, pretty much touring straight for 15 years, like nonstop, doing records, fear tours doing a new record, which takes you know six months to a year. So there was t a period during my touring cycles where there was one period in a two year span where I was only home for almost a little over two weeks. Wow, yeah. So every time you come home, it's like a vacation. You get to yeah. be home one day and it's like <laughs> gone again. See your animals and you're gone again for like two months or something. Is that the, uh, would you say that's the hardest part about being a musician is just being able to accept I mean, that it's you're depends, always going to be on the road? It depends on your personality. Yeah. Some people are just not cut out for it, you know. Right. Some people are, come home from serving and they're like, why am I home? I should be out there doing this. You know what I mean? They can't stay home. Yeah. Some people come, same from the music. Some people come <laughs> home and they're like, oh, why am I home? I need to be on tour. Right. But it's different when you have families and kids and stuff like that. But um, I didn't have kids. I was married, but I didn't have kids, so I just had dogs. Yeah. So it was a that lot was, easier. That was my deal because I thought for a while that I wanted to get into music, and then I learned early on. I was like, man, I just don't want to travel that much. So I didn't yeah, you gotta love the travel and being in the, the traveling part is not always glamorous. You know, once you get a little bigger and you finally get your own bus, and I mean, not your own own bus, you're sharing a bus with a crew and the band. You're not driving in a van. You're, you're making a move from a van into a, an actual bus. And it's usually not the nicest bus. When you're making the move from van to bus, it's the cheapest bus out of the entire fleet of all those companies <laughs> yeah. that are in the U.S. Oh, this bus company, they're only like, you know, $300 a day. Yeah. And then it's a bus, and then you learn like, oh, yeah, that used to be Willie Nelson's bus, or yeah. you know what I mean? Or there was all this history, and it was, they were called 10 Eagles in the 70s. That was like the big the newest bus and like the Leonard Skinner. When you see all those old videos, those are those eagles. It's like the Partridge family bus, except maybe not the multicolor, but <laughs> yeah. basically a school bus with racks in it or what? The, uh, <laughs> there was some of those, but then, you know, the, the cheaper tens are very, like they look very RV-ish on the inside. Yeah. And uh, everything squeaks and makes noise. And some of these colors are hideous, like banana, it was one banana yellow. <laughs> and every time you pull into the film, oh, there's that banana, there's Fear Factor in their banana boat. You know, I was yeah. like, I was like. No, my, my actual issue was I, I own, currently, I own two guitars and I can only play one riff to Californication and that's it. That's the only thing I know how to play. That's like when you shoot your bow, right? I mean, you have a bow. <laughs> <Yeah>. with... <laughs> that's hey, um, I, yeah, I, I was talking, I have another friend of mine that is a lifetime musician and so they record a lot and they tour a lot and I was talking to him a while back because I, you know, I mean, Christian knows, I mean, I spent, well, you know, I mean, I spent eight years in the Marines and so mm -hmm. you come and you go, you come and go. And, so I was talking to my other buddy about this exact thing and how similar the mus the professional musician lifestyle is to the military lifestyle. Yeah. I mean, the sacrifice for your family is essentially the same, right? I mean, you're writing checks to different people, but, you know, but... Uh, the time's gone, gone away right? exactly so the same. Just, yeah. He's home for two weeks out of a year, and when you go out and you deploy or you, uh, you know, you get orders to a duty station overseas... Um, for me, Okinawa, uh, you know, when you come back, I was gone for a year yep. and, and I saw my family, um, for two weeks. So the sacrifice is the same, man. I mean, that's a hard, hard life. Yeah. Japan is awesome though to be. No regrets though. <laughs> <laughs> my problem was too, like in that business, you get girls thrown at you every night too. Uh -huh. So <laughs> hard you know. to maintain a relationship. Are you being good on the road? Desire. Are there any chicks around? <laughs> it's like if you're married or something. Like, yeah, you know. Like, yeah, her story. You gotta have a too. because you know, you, depending on what type of band that you're in, some bands are super like, um, not only huge, but they attract the fe uh, female audience a lot better and bigger than 
my band we're like you know we looked into the crowd it was like nothing but dudes here <laughs> dude, it was so funny like we, the, our tech would come on the bus like hey guys here, an hour before you guys go on how's it look out there you know that's that that question you throw out <laughs> so how's it look out there oh terrible <laughs> and, and he's just like it's just like you know but if you're and then i used to go on tour with like cypress hill or like and we opened it for eminem and bands like and people like that and you look into the crowd, you're like, oh, my God, take me out of here. Get me out of here, <laughs> you know, because it's all beautiful women. It's yeah. like, oh, my God. So imagine if you're in, like, you know, Boy Street, Backstreet Boys or any of those boy type of bands. <laughs> and they're just screaming and crying. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I was in a... I was in a metal band with ugly dudes, so yeah, <laughs> we didn't get much luck in that. that game. Once help in a great you while, Aerosmith, right? Cause yeah, that, and usually if you see our track. type of shows, if there is any hot women out there, they're with five guys protecting <laughs> them. <laughs> if you even well, look at them, she's married. <laughs> Sorry, just, just enjoying the scenery here. <laughs> well, so um, one of the things that I was looking at when when you had reached out to us originally what was that two months ago or so mm -hmm. um and we're just kind of looking into you know maybe looking at some of our products and maybe coming up with a partnership i started looking into some of your profiles a little bit and one thing that caught my eye because not on the music side of things mm -hmm. more on the i'm a backwoods redneck grew up in the sticks side of things yeah. is all these photos with you and these giant carp yeah what what's 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 going on with that because it seems like a trend this seems like a pretty big hobby of yours it's uh in well i'm european so i grew up in belgium and uh bass fishing is is it's people do it over there they, they you know they use a spinner and stuff like that not really from boats yeah. from the side of shore but it's not a huge sport fish fish out there in in in, in the states bass fishing is huge right, right? in europe Carp is considered a huge sport fish. Really? Yeah. The industry for carp fishing in Europe and Eastern Europe and England, where a lot of the companies come from, there's a lot of European companies, but the, 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 the strongest big hole companies are, are all England. And it's a $10 billion industry. Wow. It's massive. All the gear, it's almost like the, the shooting industry. I mean, the detail to everything is so intense with even a chair to sit in on the side of the lake yeah. for fishing that chair is camo it's got padding on it yeah it's got a carp logo on it. i mean everything is made especially for that sport and it, there's a lot of money being thrown at it. and and some of the conventions for that sport in europe yeah. are massive for, with like hundred thousands of people going to these shows wow so i grew up on it ever since i was like 12 13 years old i've been doing it in europe and catching some of these fish in europe some of these fish were planted in some of these lakes right after World War II. Wow. And this is 1982, 83, and I'm catching these yeah. fish and, you know, real, not really realizing how old these fish are. They've been, somebody put them, like, after World War II, maybe like the early 50s even. Yeah. So these fish, they grow old. They grow big. They're, you know, they're, they're, a lot of people will say, oh, it's carp, carp. Oh, they destroyed the infrastructure of bass fishing and right. they're blah, blah, blah. All fish eat eggs, okay? Yeah. Caviar of the of ocean or, or the freshwater caviar, it's the eggs that fish spawn out, all fish, turtles, catfish, everybody right. grew, uh, grubs on that stuff. And it's like the caviar of the of freshwater. Right. And, um, you know, there's a lot of other, like, uh, there's a lot of other species that are way more harmful to uh, bass eggs if that's what they're worried about right which are crappia and all those other fish they're yeah. way more aggressive bluegill actually bluegill is way more aggressive and will kill any bass egg if it sees a carp is actually good for well we're talking about the domestic type of carp now if we're talking about silver carp this is where people don't have education right they think oh they heard the word carp and they hear the stories about the bass industry being pulverized by right. these by these fish yeah and it's not true because carp are actually way more um, good. They're good for your pond. They're good for for fertilizer. Uh, the, there's people that grow and they have koi f swimming in right, between yeah. the, the the plants and stuff. Uh, they fertilize really well and and they're they're 
they dig up the bottom for a lot of worms and stuff like that, bloodworm beds and stuff like that, where other fish now are able to eat from. Because carp and cat, catfish to me is actually the nuisance fish. Yeah. If I catch a catfish, I won't even touch it with my bare hands. I put gloves on and I'm like, <laughs> get out of here. <laughs> I think it's the most disgusting fish on the planet. And, yeah. and, I, and even though I fish, here. and I will hold a Eight. big ass 20, 30, 40, 50 pound carp yeah. and I will kiss that thing and, and I'll cuddle it and hang on with it in the water and like let it swim off. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. But a catfish, I'll, I will kick that fucker back into the lake. <laughs> I eat the crap out of catfish, man. I mean, yeah, I love, yeah, a lot of times when I fish Texas and stuff, I keep all the catfish that catch. Yeah. and I'll give it to one of the locals hey you guys want catfish right. oh hell yeah you got oh, yeah. some and they'll look at me 30 of them you get like that away. really yeah. you don't want them I'm like no please take it oh that's some good eating you know what I mean now flip side of that do you eat do you ever eat the carp never, never. we okay. don't kill them and you know when you're cat in Europe imagine if you're on one of those lakes in Europe mm. all the lakes in Europe they're all protected no. with these anglers they're almost like in the hunting industry. Like, imagine if there's like the perfect hunting ground somewhere. People are going to try to preserve that. They're not going to let people like kill all those animals. They're going to make sure there's always animals and to keep, you know, the harvesting new animals and stuff. In carp fishing, you're putting them back. You want the fellow angler to catch, gotcha. you know, there's a 40, 50 pound carp that's been around for 30, 40 years. Some of these fish in Europe have names. Yeah. You know, and they're actually famous. If somebody catches one of these famous fish out of a very famous lake that's been around for a thousand years in England, and that carp was 50 pounds, it's the first English 50, you're on the front cover of the biggest magazines in fishing and all over Europe and England, and all of a sudden your fame is getting sponsored by companies and stuff like that. That's awesome. Imagine if I shot a 500-pound boar tomorrow. Right. With, you know, People my sig mark, with my sig mark and stuff, and I take a picture. <laughs> I mean, we can have a field day with that picture because that's a giant. Oh my yeah, God, yeah. look at the map. And it's kind of like in car fishing too. Like you'll see guys with fish 80, 90, 100 pounds, man. And they're like, they can't even lift them out of the water. Yeah. And there's also a sport in, in you know, like Thailand, which is a Siamese carp. And they're massive three, four, five hundred pounders. Really? Yeah. And they, you, three people, you got to lift them out of their Siamese carp. And Dang. it's all part of the carp family, which is the koi family. Yeah. So it's a huge sport. And ca when you hook one of those, even if you're out here in the lake and you're catching a 15, 20 pounder, which for me is like, I don't even take pictures of that. I take pictures of anything above 30. Yeah. So if you catch one right here, your rod is going out. You're just like, zzz, 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 zzz. and you're like, you know what I mean? You're not just pulling that yank and it in, yeah. kind of like how bass fishing. You're like, oh, you're, you're trying to, your hook hold. Yeah. And you don't want to lose that fish. And you're pulling that thing as quick on the deck as you can. Yeah. In car fishing, that fight, will last sometimes 30, 35, 50 minutes. Damn. And that part right there, it's like that thrill. Yeah. And then when you get that thing in the net and you look at it and you're like, oh my God. And people look like, what? That lives in here? And you're like, yup. That feeling is amazing. So if I was puttering around a lake in Europe with like 10 of those in a cooler. Oh my God, they will kill you. <laughs> You'll get killed. Yeah. No, they will. They, you, because some of these anglers, carp anglers in Europe, they're part of mafias, all kinds of. There's, there's people that love that sport. Yeah. And they come from all terrains of life. Yeah. And there's. I've heard there, the carp stories of these anglers that have been around since the 60s and the 70s doing that, that basically built the sport to yeah. what it is today. The stories of these guys, I know some of these guys, and the stories, you're like, they are like war stories. You'll sit in the bar and they're telling stories about these fishing stories about them and things that happen at the lake yeah. that you're just like, what? No, I mean, so crazy. the best stories, but these fish are protected and public lakes too. There's yeah. locals that will burn down your car. If I showed up in Europe and I just started tossing my rigs into a lake right there because I know and I've heard there's some 60 pounders swimming in there. And I just, okay, nobody here. I got my fishing license. I'm good. I'm legal. Yeah. I'm allowed to fish here. Yeah. And I just start fishing. You'll see cars pulling up. Locals checking you Locals out. Locals checking you out. Then I'll start at night. That, and then if you I happen to a famous angler, which is a friend of mine, he's probably like one of the most noticeable anglers on, on Instagram. His name is Daryl Peck. He went fishing at a lake in France. And um, he knew the fish were way out of his reach yeah. so he started double spooling they call it mm -hmm. you like put the line out so far and you row it back with a boat or like motor it back with a boat until your spool is empty 600 meters on it 
you link it to another spool, put that spool on your reel, and you keep going. So you're fishing at 1,200 yards. Wow. So he was fishing behind this bar, the sandbar that he knew the fish were over there. Yeah. But you can't get it from the, it's like this crazy lake where you constantly have to move because all this swamp. Yeah. And you keep sinking away and the water keeps rising and going down. And he's out there for like six weeks fishing and he's blanking for like four weeks. There's a film on, on YouTube about it. It's amazing. And then he starts catching them because he figures it out. Yeah. And when the locals realized because they saw other anglers come, coming up taking pictures of him, which yeah. companies he worked with in England, to take all that footage for, for their social media and stuff. And he was catching 50s and 60s one after another and going like, yeah, I'm on the, I got, I got him. Because you got to find these fish. Yeah. The locals burned down their car sitting in the parking lot Holy half a mile smokes. away. And they saw explosions in the distance. What's going on over there? I don't know. That's kind of where we're parked, isn't it? You know, oh and my they God. got pictures in their cars, their passports, everything that was in it, oh. torched down to the floor. The locals came, oh, really? You're fishing here? Bam. Oh. They lit that shit on fire. <laughs> oh, my So God. it's like that out there. You can't just show up at a lake out there. You have to know people, be invited. And the public lakes are so protected by the locals yeah. that from out, are you from out of time? They see that bivy, we call them bivvies, those little tents. Yeah. And you know it's a carp angler, and you, you can tell by the setup because we use alarms on our rods. Yeah. So imagine an alarm sitting right here. So it, when the rod goes off, it just yeah. and then you wake up, you get out your sleeping bag, and yeah. it's a lifestyle. It's really cool. Yeah. And it's growing in America. There's one shop in the U.S. that I deal with called Big Carp Tackle, where everybody buys their uh, their carp fishing kit from. Sure. They got a distribution deal with all the European companies. And there's a lot of Euro uh, Europeans that moved to America that love doing that sport. So they're looking for that trill in the U.S. And in the U.S., there is some amazing fishing. The problem is in Europe, it's all over ran. And yeah. all those English lakes, you have to buy tickets. And some of those lakes that have amazing fish yeah. and legendary fish. If you catch a 30 or 40 out of that lake, you're famous type of thing. You're, yeah. the, you're the man. Yeah. And you're on a bus for a year off of that. But you'll pay in those tickets might be $2,000 a week. Wow. to fish on that lake it's that expensive you know yeah. like and the waiting list 10 15 years you're on a waiting list waiting for, for people to drop off there's only like th let's say 40 tickets for that lake that's, that's and pretty if you live in a certain region now you got to drive three four hundred miles to be able to enjoy something you love doing yeah no matter if it's fishing or hunting it takes a lot of the joy out you know yeah. so for me moving from california to texas was the best thing for fishing and also for hunting and everything else but for fishing california all these rules you can only fish two rods no baiting they call it chumming over here but we call it baiting up yeah. no baiting um you can't use a boat uh no you you know boat ramp you, no public boat ramps uh all these oh no you can't sleep at the lake at night you gotta get off it's sun's going down you gotta get out of here all these rules in right. texas you can fish 99 hooks so yeah. if you have 99 <laughs> rods, if you can handle all that um, rod, uh, you know, um, management, go ahead, fish 99 rods. Yeah. Um, you can sleep in the lake as long as you want. They'll come and check up on you and see if you're still alive, <laughs> you know, if you're not eaten by the gator or something. But it's, you know, it's so lenient out here. You can yeah. bait up, you use a boat, you can really enjoy the things that you love doing. And, you know, and there's not that many states that still have that. That's and funny. especially for you know anything that comes with rifles and hunting and i think i might have some pretty strong european ties yeah because uh, we live on a little Irish. part we live on a little part of the brazos river yeah. uh, here locally mm -hmm. and uh anytime somebody is down there in the river or um you know whatever they're doing whether it's just walking around fishing or yeah. in a boat or something like that i'm right there on the bank of my property just staring at them like hey i'm gonna burn your truck doing? down hey you know who that is how the how the fuck right. do they get down here? You know, burn his but truck. That, that's oh, why. Wait, you know, there's you a lot see of a vehicle parked anywhere. But there's wait. a lot of lakes like in Carbecue. Texas where people have been like doing like the bow thing, bow fishing. Oh yeah. And people get really into it. But there's a lot of people around those lakes that don't like it because they use all the big lights. There's a lot of noise uh -huh. that comes with it. So when all these people that live on those lakes all gather up at the city and be like, we don't want that. It's gone. So I was gonna say, Jeff and I like to fish for carp too. We're big carp anglers with boats. <laughs> How, yeah. So how do you feel about bow fishing? My guess is I, you're against I, it. Yeah, I'm not for it. Okay. I mean, it's the the problem is if you take those fish home and you cook them, 
or you, you use them as fertilizer or you're doing something useful with, do them. Something with them. Yeah. But if you leave it on the bank a to rot. A lot of rot, people just dump them. Yeah. You know, you're dumping it. Yeah, in the, in the car fishing world, it, it doesn't really go over that well. Yeah, I wouldn't and think so. It's not like, uh, you know, and I, it's not like I get it. I understand why people don't get it. Yeah. You know, because a lot of people look at us going like, why are you killing all these hogs? Like people that I live with in California are... I remember having a girlfriend. She was a super hot girlfriend. I was like, I'm going to go hog hunting tomorrow. She goes, oh, hell, no, you're not. You're not. You know what I mean? <laughs> no way you're not. I'm like, why not? I'm going to go shoot a hog with my buddy from Prime Ammunition. It yeah. was like, you know, my buddy Jason is a SWAT team guy. He goes, go, go hog hunting with us. I'm like, yeah, I want to try that. And she goes, nope, no, you're not. And sure enough, I wasn't. <laughs> you know? <laughs> it's like... Um, you know, a lot of people don't get it. Yeah, ex-girlfriend. A lot of people girlfriend. don't get it, you know? It explains a lot. And then, yeah, we, just need to t- we, need, we need to take them bow fishing with us. I don't think we it'll go over well. Cat. I'll shoot all the catfish you want. We'll get you hooked. Here's we can't, shoot, we can't shoot catfish. You can't shoot catfish in Texas anymore. Hey, you could I'll a couple you, years ago. I thought oh, I was really? a rock star when I shot a 20 pound, 21 pound fish. He, I thought I was going to be on the cover uh, magazine. He shot Nobody a 21 pound grassy carp. Oh, grass carp, yeah. I mean, not my favorite carp. I like the the... The ones that you really don't see a lot in America, which is uh, the mirror carp, they're called mirrors. They have all these different, the regular carp that we know that they look golden brown, kind of that white, uh, sorry, that yellow gold, uh, reddish fins, and they all have the small little uh, um, scales. But the the mirror carp have scales in places. Sometimes some they're called leather leather carp. Yeah. They have no scales. They're just blank. Oh really? Oh that's yeah, cool. Yeah, there's mirrors. There's letters. There's there is a. a, a a, a carp um, called a linear carp, mm-hmm. which is just a carp with one scale, one one set of scales, a row just going all the middle of it from the head to the tail. That's interesting. With no scales on the top of the bottom, it's just one row of scales. Now, are any of these are any of these um, like genetically modified, or are they well, all natural well, species? The, there is, so that's a big debate in in England because they have a lot of homegrown carp that came from England. Uh-huh. A lot of European carp that are grown in Europe in a lot of these fisheries. Um, you know, there was there was stealing carp in between lakes, moving them from one lake oh, to yeah, another sure. in the night. There was all kinds of thievery going on in that industry because yeah. that industry was making a lot of money. So people were like, oh, I can make a lot of money. I need 30 pounders in my lake. So people would buy yeah. tickets on my lake. And that guy would go steal them from some place where they what that was like protected by some something something yeah so later on in life people like hey i think these fish came from over there. investigations yeah. were done people got arrested in that industry wow. like for doing like you know moving fish around could cause severe damage to ecosystems even if they're just friendly fish uh if there is a thing called koi, uh, koi herpes so when you're moving fish around you got to make sure those fish yeah. were never exposed to that herpes make sure they're clean and they're clean and stuff uh-huh. so there's a lot of Israeli. Kevin, you know of all about that. Yeah, it's Israeli like, carp yeah. carries stuff around like luggage. No, the herpes. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I just. Hey, let me. That's just not koi herpes. That's <laughs> because I feel a little defensive. So full disclosure. That's eye herpes. I'm looking through a scope. Full disclosure. I only bow fished because Jeff talked me into it. It's a peer pressure thing, and so I literally have only bow fished a maybe a couple hundred times for couple purely hundred. experimental reasons. Right. A couple hundred times. Yeah. And of those I mean, couple hundred times, he shot three fish. <laughs> to me, it's, it's just... It's a game of numbers. <laughs> I mean, it, in, the, in, the, in our sport, they're very like, you know, the people really like, they're kind of like a protective thing to us. For me, it's especially when they're like 30, 40, 50 pounders because those numbers yeah. are... If you get a fish at that in that range, it's rare. And then seeing one put an arrow through one of his head and just leave it on the side of the bank, knowing that oh, so yeah. many people in this country could have benefited well building the sport by catching one of those sure, fish yeah. and be able to show them in Absolutely. pictures and well, and we'll grow our sport. You, you know? compared it to hog hunting earlier, and I think there's a there's an easier justification for hog hunting when Absolutely. when the hunters can say, you yeah. know, look, they are actively destroying. Yeah. If those uh, carp are destroying our rivers and our lakes, what people are saying they are. No, right. that's yeah. the but, Asian carp. That's right. a completely different species. Right. That that that's a sport actually. If you're in a boat, but you have to be. Pre- <laughs> you, you probably have to wear a helmet because those things will fly you. They have these electro magnetic uh, pulses that they put in inside oh, really? the water oh, wow. so they shoot 50,000 volts around the boat in the water wow. and as you're riding that boat these fish are just jumping out of the water 
and they look like these silver looking tuna actually it yeah. doesn't even look like a carp yeah. it looks like a tuna that's a lot flatter in size and they're long and they're really stiff yeah. fish and that's what an Asian carp is. They're like almost like a so steelhead. They catch them with nets out of the air. What do they call them? Steelheads steelhead, or yeah. something like that. It's almost like something like that. Like we're super invasive because um, those are invasive in Florida, right? So yeah. when they jump up, are they netting or they catch them with? They nets jump or up and they have these nets on the side of the boats wow. that they they catch them. But there's people just like when they jump up, just shooting, shooting them out of the sky. <laughs> oh. It's like clay shooting oh, the fish. Man. That's kind of cool. Actually. Yeah, they have them up in the Midwest too. Right? There was a video circulating a long time ago where. Uh, these people were bow fishing these they call them the flying carp yeah, yeah. That's yeah. I Asian think it might have yeah. been Tiffany Lacoste yeah and they hit one in the air fish hit her in the face and I think broke her nose or oh, something oh crap hell yeah, yeah. Because, I, can't, I can't say for certain those fish are her, like I bone. think it was but anyway a fish come out of the water yeah. and smacked this woman right in the face they're that's like bone nuts. these things that's they're nuts. really really tough fish well I got to transition us now um, back over to the, the hog hunting side of things yeah so you didn't get to go um, when you were dating that girl from California. No. Um, I'm guessing you've been since then. You finally got yeah. a taste of night hunting at some point, didn't you? I, I basically, yeah, I have been. And if I go out, if I go outside that house that night, I'm on that ranch. Yeah. I'm on a 5,000 acre section that's part of a 30,000 acre uh, property. Yeah. And as soon as I walk outside that house, I can come in contact with hogs or coyotes. Yeah. And it's every time when, you don't, when you're not taking that rifle out, you'll see some. Right. And, you know, everybody's laughing at me on the ranch, like, because I'm always strapped yeah. with a rifle on my chest. And I'm like, we're going to the front gate? Even if I'm just driving <laughs> to the front gate, I'm yeah. taking my rifle. Yeah. So that's what I've been building over the last few weeks. One thing I got is, a, is an ATV. Okay. That was a great purchase. Came up with a 2020 Polaris that I saw on Craigslist for half of the price what the guy put into. Sure, yeah. And I couldn't really, you know, let that go. And so I got that. I've been um, I've been hog hunting with my buddy for Scott from Zeph yeah. Arms, Zeph Industries, and he wears a helmet like this with a full fusion setup. Yeah. Which is super expensive. We take the uh, we got the Rubicon that's his that he takes the front window down that we take the doors off, oh. and I'm just sitting outside the Rubicon, just kind of like he's sitting in a helicopter. Yeah, and uh, he drives the helmet on, and he's just scanning it where, and he pulls over like, get out, get out. Yeah, 200 yards right up ahead, left side, and we get out and we set up, you know, we set up and try to get him, but we just drive around that ranch yeah. all night, and he's oh, got man. the helmet set up. So I started learning things, you know. I got the, the trail uh, two on my rifle and I've been spotting with that. So yeah. I've been kind of basically sitting on the side and you know, I don't want to waste battery life too much either because you're sitting there sometimes for a long time right, doing yeah, it and absolutely. you're going through modes or whatever and you're wasting battery life. And the last thing I want to do is run out of battery by the time the action is there. Sure, yeah. So I've been, in carp fishing, we use these battery packs yeah. and uh, you can charge your laptop like 15 times with it. It's like really, what, really cool battery packs mm -hmm. that are about this big. And I got the cord, the power cord, going into the trail, and I put it on power mode. Yeah. So it's constantly charging there you go. when I'm just, you know, when I'm just looking and, and, and scanning. Yeah. And I've been doing it like that, and it's getting a lot better. I got to find a sling for the rifle, which I've never had a, a, a decent sling. So I put a sling on, I put that thing high on my chest, and it's a lot easier to, like, you know what I mean, to scan. Yeah. And, and but that's definitely it's funny you talk about the uh helmet mounted systems yeah that's how uh, I, and driving I, those i was know, thinking Jeeps like or, you know if i have if i'm on my atv and i had that oh man i'd be and even even if i just had a, mon, a mono you know yeah you can still because you're just rolling slow and i got all the lights turned off I'm thinking about blacking out the, the the stopping lights in the back of my atv you could probably just ride and just kind of like scan like low you know what i mean march yeah. the road a little bit yeah you well, I've said that. From, I've said from the beginning that this podcast was not going to be a sales pitch on product, but I am going to call out those products right there, which this is the monocular. So this is literally the same thing that's on that helmet right there. Right. It's the exact same Ooh. thing. Um, there's just two of them, and this is the first one on the market in its price point for digital night vision right so it's different than the trail it's not thermal yeah it's digital night vision yeah. it runs off of um ir lights mm -hmm. uh, is what allows you to see at night but it freaking awesome little unit that we just came out i mean with. 
in you hog can, hunting you, you, you cannot have a mono or something because you, if you're looking through that scope it's actually better to go with something cheaper on top of your rifle yeah. and something more expensive that you're holding because eventually yeah. you're going to be looking through this thing all night yeah and only when the action goes down you turn that on and uh -huh. you use it for five ten yeah. twenty seconds yeah. and you, this is you know you're better off having a 640 in this or something or yeah. something really expensive in that and and save well, a little more money on, so on a those scope. have a built-in ir light on them which is pretty cool but when you put it on a helmet what yeah. we did because chris and i chris is running the cameras for the podcast chris and i and uh the other oh, videographer yeah. we at we just went out to our ranch here the cellmark ranch mm -hmm. and uh we did an overnight shoot using that setup right there with them on the helmet driving the atv around yeah. at nighttime and i'll tell you what the key is um you got to get some ir light bars if you're gonna run yeah. it that way, yeah, we have. We, that's a game changer. We you had kill them on your the headlights. Yeah, we had them on yeah. the on the Rubicon. Oh, and he goes, man. look through the look through the helmet. Yes. I looked through it when he turned that light on. Dude, it, it was like the everything. biggest headlights ever. You're just like this. and I turned it on, and nothing. I looked and it was nothing. I was yep. like, whoa. Yeah, you had one of those 12 inch light bars yeah. that you put on the front. Absolutely. Yeah. And he had the the laser on his rifle as well, and I'm like, because. I can't see him right and he'd be looking over there and he goes watch right there and he just point the yeah. laser yeah the, the hawks can't see the laser right he can only see it through his night vision yeah and i was like wow man that technology is crazy it's crazy it's, it's, That's it's amazing and again not a sales pitch but i mean one of the reasons we love that one is i mean it has a number of different features that i like i mean hands-free and i still i can still record my stock yeah i would say if you were to compare the digital night vision uh, capability of that one um, compared to generational night vision, you're probably talking maybe Gen 2 plus. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, detection range of say what uh, uh, maybe upwards of 300 yards. Yeah. But you you know you can video your stock and everything. Um, but um, in my military world, um, you know PBS 14 when they first came on the scene were super expensive. Right. And actually they came on the scene after the scene after I was I was out, but I knew the price ranges. And even still today, you're talking like twenty five hundred all the way up to eight grand. I mean, it's a huge, right. a ridiculously high price range for the generational night vision, right? And these are what you know, seven hundred bucks yeah. a piece or so. Yeah. How much are these? A p and you can run the dual on the bridge, just like that setup right there. So yeah. it's a it's yeah. a pretty so, sweet deal. So that's the dual. So it's the same unit twice, yep. basically. Yeah, it's yep. really cool. It's immersive. So even though they're two separate units, when you look through them, your brain is only picking up one device. Yeah. It's some. It's like looking yeah. through a pair of binoculars. Yeah, because the fusion setups, so you, you gotta get used to that a little bit. You're like, hey, what is yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's ways so you can look through both of them at the same time and get used to it. Sure. So what um, for you when you first got into night hunting? What was your biggest obstacle to, to overcome? Like, what was the, what was the thing that you were at most iffy about? And I'll tell you what mine was when I started, which was just figuring out like the distance on what it is I'm looking at. Cause sometimes yeah, you look through those digital units and it might seem like they're, they're like 40 yards away. In reality, they might be 120 yards away. <laughs> like, well, part I, of that is you're starting out with a base magnification, right? Yeah. It's not a one power. Right. I mean, for me, it was not, not that, but I know what you're saying and I can relate with that a little bit too when I was looking at you know, I was looking at it, and I'm like, oh, there's something out there right there. I'm like, is that a pig? Yeah. And and then finally when it stuck his head up and it moved, yeah. I could tell it was not. It was it was uh, an armadillo. Yeah. But just <laughs> the distance, for some reason, through you know, it looks so it big. It made it look huge. It yeah. looked, made it look huge, even though that animal was so small. So at night, you know, figuring out that depth and how big that animal really is in right. real life. Yeah. It's you gotta get used to that a little bit. Yeah, yeah, it's something yeah, you learn. You just gotta look through that scope constantly, so you learn how all those animals move at night and how they sit, and because they're they're usually eating and looking for stuff. Well, at my place, you know, we will we'll go out with either the thermals or the digital night vision, and we'll I will spot an animal far away. We're talking maybe 600 yards plus. And some of these digital, I mean, you take a digital night vision with that sniper hog IR light right yeah. there, you can push that unit out to 600 yards easy. Oh yeah. But I'll be able to see stuff out that far and just like you said, after after a little while of learning how these animals move and yeah. behave, you can tell. You're I can confident. take somebody brand new out and look at something 100 or 600 yards away and tell them that's not a group of pigs, that's a deer. Yeah. How do you know? That just looks like a blob. Because like, some deer look like coyotes sometimes, I, I you know? I know for sure. Like, you can tell. Watch yeah. that skinny neck. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's just, 
you know, they look, these coyotes look on, on thermal or night vision, they start looking more like, like hyenas. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Because yeah. the ears, the way they look, and they don't look like the coy- they don't look like that spiky coyote head. Yeah. You don't see that on the camera unless you got really close up on night vision or something. But have you been getting um, good at calling in coyotes? Well, this is another thing I kind of I now with the ATV, the guy who had already put aftermarket speakers on it, uh-huh. Bluetooth speakers, yeah. which is great. But I was carrying. Basically, I'm take on the on the ranch. I take care of a bunch of goats. Yeah. And um and I had a bunch of new babies in the morning and and I picked one up and it had all these little um, what do you call them those Texas stickers oh, those yeah. little oh, yeah. gnarly little the burrs the with those spikes burrs. with those spikes yeah. on it they're super sharp and this goat I picked it up I was like ah I had all these stickers on, on the bottom so I started pulling them off and and I was recording him and he was just not happy and he's like Wah! like screaming yeah. this little baby goat and I'm recording him and I'm like wait a minute that's a great caller isn't it <laughs> so I went home in my studio, and I recorded all these baby goat sounds really? into of them being in distress because yeah. I was holding. It's like, Wah! so I put it on my Pro Tools, cut all the noise in between up, made it, put more volume on the file, EQ'd it, made it all sound good. A little bit of reverb, just a hair of delay, just yeah. kind of like you know, make it sound really good. Made a file out of it, and I sent it to myself, and then played on my phone. Oh, holy moly! And then I was talking to Hans from uh, ETS. Yeah. Um, from that uh, channel, the hog hunting channel, yeah. and uh, uh, you said Hans, Hans, right? Uh, yeah, um, it was uh, Legacy Outfitters. Legacy Outfitters, yeah. And uh, Hans East, uh, Hans East Texas, yeah. yeah. He's a good dude. Yeah, I was, and I showed him. I sent him a little uh, um, Instagram message, a little video of my Pro Tools session. I played him. You know, see, yeah. you see the wave file like that, and. And he goes, dude, you're on to something. Yeah. Are those the ghosts from your ranch? I'm like, yeah. He goes, that's genius. That's great. Yeah. You know, and I go, I just put on on my Bluetooth, and then I just sit there. And I haven't, I got into like shooting some more pigs, but um, one of these days when I know where the coyotes are at, because yeah. sometimes I go outside the house and you just hear them like, you know, hundreds of them like just right. all packed up somewhere. Yep. And then I'll gonna go out there and I'll put them put that thing up and just turn it on on my bluetooth on my speakers oh you gotta let us know how that there. turns out because that yeah. sounds genius they're used, they're probably well, used to trying to pick those yeah. goats off they have those they? expensive I... collars they're 700 oh, yeah. bucks yeah. They hey well um them. how many acres is the place here honey it's it's a thirty thousand acre well twenty eight twenty eight thousand acre property and yeah. we're managing our section is five thousand okay so i was asking because i just wanted you to know that your new best friend kevin me <laughs> has a full size, you know, Fox Pro setup if you ever want to employ that. I, you, 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 your you, BFF has you're it. back now from all your vacationing you've been doing that in Europe. He murders carp. Um it's carp I, murder. Hey, I just want you to know that when I was overseas, he was messaging me, not you. So hey. <laughs> you can We're gonna be back, back man. Hey. hey. You wouldn't have met him if it wasn't for me. Uh, so you're yeah, welcome. That's true. That's true. <laughs> We could share. All right, we can sit here. Hey, um, <laughs> we can sit here and fight over <laughs> we Christian share, all man. day. <laughs> don't don't fight it, man. Just it. I think. Uh, what uh, hey, um, I did want to tell you that uh, I, we talked about this uh, when we were visiting last time about the 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 call that you made. Mm-hmm. I was telling you my buddy made a he recorded his newborn baby crying. Oh my god! Yeah, it probably works. It, his wife wasn't happy about it because he was capitalizing on an opportunity. He recorded this baby crying for like f- his baby crying for like five minutes. Yeah, it was a colicky. I don't know what it was, but it was crying. Hillary Clinton there. showed up. Dude, that guy has killed so many coyotes with his baby oh. call. Oh, really? That's yeah. nuts. <laughs> because it sounds like those, tell me those animals. Baby politician like, showed up. It's, a, this, uh, no. it's still a distress <laughs> sound, you know. That baby crying sounds like it's you know it's, it's yeah. It's the way those goats sound. I mean, the, some of those sounds that they're making. Babies and a, goats. Yeah. That's nuts. Well, uh, yeah. we're running pretty close on time here, so what I'm going to do is go ahead and uh, let you go. I yeah. appreciate you coming in. It was in. fun having me in, man. Thank I you mean, so that much. Was some, that was some good conversation. It's cool doing things with podcasts and, you know, stuff in the gun world. It's something that, you know, there's a lot of musicians that love firearms and love this sport and, and everything that comes with it and hunting. And, you know, people like Ted Nugent are the most noticeable ones on, on the market. But there's a lot of other guys from, you know, Five Finger Death Punch and, there's a friend of mine, Azale Dine, I think, the singer Phil. Yeah. I think is that the, I'm not sure if that was his band, but uh, Phil. Um, there's a lot of guys that just, but, you know, a lot of guys don't really 
are open so open about it on Instagram right. and stuff like that because sure. there's yeah. a lot of liberalism going on in music today. Yeah, well, and you've people also, that are very anti-gun. They're probably also trying to figure out like how to maintain their base yeah. crowd. Because you, you lose you a lot of. Wanna, yeah, I've, I've posted pictures of guns and stuff on my. If I start posting videos of me shooting hogs yeah i'm sure um, half of my followers would be like gone yeah because they probably think it's the most inhumane thing in the world hey i i just wanted to ask you real quick because i know you know you and i bounce a lot on yeah. social media and stuff i know you're you're still active with um like power flow and and violence and all that so i just want to ask you like what are you doing now man i'm well i just dropped a record on march 4th we dropped a new violence record it's our first new music in 28 years oh, that's and awesome. this is a band a trash metal band from the 80s that i grew up on idolizing when i still lived in europe so now playing with them is just kind of like surreal still you know because they were like really my favorite band on yeah the, everybody's favorite band was metallica yeah mine was like the <laughs> most mine <laughs> mine was the most least favorite out of that entire bunch out of the bay area and um so playing with them and playing with power flow with send from cypress hill and billy from biohazard um we got a record dropping at the end of the year yeah. that's already been recorded, but we got to wait until Cypress Hill drops a record in between, I think. And we start touring in May. So our, oh, wow. our, our schedule starts in mid-May and we have May and June. I think July I have off, but August and September I'll be in like South America and, and Europe uh, in November and December. We're doing the Headbangers Ball Tour in Europe. Um, so it's finally we're starting to get into these shows you know yeah. and, and and touring and because we're not we're not playing shows if they require for all vaccination cards and all the, these rules and regulations we're right. not playing them so, i just came back from europe dude you're lining out a lot of countries <clears throat> yeah i'm, I'm getting there. a cough <laughs> <laughs> no um it's gonna be cool man it's, we're playing so we're, we're gonna be playing uh eastern europe I going think. to bulgaria I think it, my friends are are the Deftones, yeah. the band Deftones, and they got shows in the Ukraine and Russia. Oh no, <laughs> oh, no. that's a little awkward. Uh -oh. They're probably not gonna go there. <laughs> <laughs> They're like they were still thinking about going. They're like, oh, I'm like come on guys, there's a no. full on war going there's on. War. <laughs> you should probably cancel the rest of Europe for the summer, probably too, <laughs> just in case, because you know. Oh, but man, that's that's, that's one thing about a lot of musicians they still think they, they can go play a show even in the middle of a war some bands actually will probably do it well yeah. we do have a place for that it's called the uso i'm just saying <laughs> yeah uh oh. christian how can um if anybody's watching this and they want to follow you or anything like that what are your social handles how can they find you uh easiest would probably be um on instagram which is christian oldie wolbers so O L D E W O L B E R S is my entire last name, um, and uh, that's probably the one I'm most active on. I also just got on Truth. Okay. Um, handle Fear Factory, simple. H handle Fear Factory on yeah. Truth. Okay. Um, and um, yeah, those are the only two platforms I kind of care about. I don't really care about Twitter, even though I have an account. I don't. I never really go on it. Yeah. I don't really care for it. No. Uh, and Facebook, I never really care for it at all, at all. even though I have a page but and i always thought facebook was junk even when they started it yeah myspace was kind of cool back in the day take me back to myspace well, that's good. <laughs> you like myspace because yeah. it was like yeah. music based. yeah and then everybody's like facebook and i'm like facebook yeah. oh. and then i kind of tried it i'm like this sucks yeah. I can't customize <laughs> anything you can get in touch with people from high school yeah. <laughs> what no thanks <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they know <All> my right. <laughs> secrets <laughs> i know all right, well, I'm going to power it down here. All right, so, man. Thanks for having me, guys. Hey, thanks for coming in. Appreciate it. Kevin? Yeah, thanks, dude. Thanks for coming on, man, and thanks for keeping it PG. Thanks for trusting me, man. See? Yeah, you did good. <laughs> I censored myself. I kept it low-key. <laughs>